Uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone to yet another um, El Muxic webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure for Kate and, and me to see uh, the response. Um, how many people have registered? Uh, over 80 people who have shown to have uh, interest in, in MOOCs and in languages. And when we were thinking about the topic for the webinar, um, there was something going around in our heads. What have we achieved in all these years? What did language MOOCs ever do for us? So we decided that had to be the title of the webinar. And we invited three researchers in the topic. And we are very, very grateful to Marina, Napat and Barbara, who said yes um, the minute we contacted them. And um, so um, it's the time to reflect on what we have achieved. We all know both practitioners and researchers, that one thing that the MOOCs have enabled is the, the availability of quality resources uh, for language learning for free. Mm -hmm. uh, very prestigious institutions have uh, language MOOCs available these days. And it has redefined the role of the teacher and the learner. And um, it's definitely student center. The student has to be autonomous. Um, let's face it too, that is a challenge. Um, some research has uh, confirmed that at times it may make the experience of learning a language less enjoyable, less productive, and especially in the oral skills, especially in oral production. So I'm sure all this will come up in, uh, in the webinar today. And also there's the issue of sustainability. Where are we going from here? Is this a sustainable model? However, um, the future looks promising because uh, with the pandemic, we've seen a boost in online learning. Um, 2020 was entitled the second year of the MOOC and um, especially foreign languages have made it to the top 10 topics uh, in MOOCs. So there is a, a documented interest in learning a language online through a MOOC. And that's what we are going to be talking about today. So uh, the floor is yours, Marina, Napat, and Barbara. Uh, Kate, you wanted to talk about Eurocall first, right? Before we... <laughs> yeah, just take a bit of your time, just two seconds before we hand over to our fabulous speakers. Um, just to say, um, and Eleanor, I think is going to share. Well, some... You want me to share the screens, right? Yeah, uh, if you yeah, could just share a couple of slides. So this event is a language MOOC special interest group event, part of the European Association for Computer Assisted Language Learning, otherwise known as Eurocall. Um, and I think most of you are probably members, <laughs> which is lovely to see. Okay, just um, one second, because I'm not able to, to share. Ah, here it is. I couldn't find it. Um, right. Now everyone uh, there we are. Brilliant. Yes. So you recall there, there you can see those slides just to quickly say uh, that's our logo, the European Association for Computer Assisted Language Learning. We have various spaces where you can find us. You can find us on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, please go and join those groups. Um, I, I don't know if you could just move to the next slide. That's right. So who are we? So we bring together researchers and practitioners and developers who feel passionate about the use of technology for the learning and teaching of languages and cultures. Uh, where can you find us? Well, there's the annual conference, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. There are special interest groups like this one, the Language MOOC uh, SIG. We have the journal Recalled and Eurocall Review and our LinkedIn and Facebook groups and they are community groups. So please join those uh, and share the good news amongst the community. So please join our association if you haven't done so yet and become part of our community and contribute to it with us. Thank you. Um, you can stop sharing the screen now, Elna. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. So I believe it's over to me then, is it, to welcome our fantastic speakers. So we have with us uh, Barbara Conde Gaffaro, uh, who has just completed a doctorate at the Open University in the UK on self-regulated learning and goal setting in MOOCs, and it's something she's going to talk to uh, in a second. 
Her interests in modern languages, uh, educational technology and social cognitive theory have led her to form a solid foundation in language education, online learning and research. She did her master studies at Coventry University uh, and her doctorate journey at the OU and she worked as a research assistant for the British Council ELTRA awarded project, the BMELT project. By the end of her PhD, she was working closely with the director of the Institute of Educational Technology and the senior research manager of OpenTEL at the Open University. We also have um, Napat Jitpai Sanawatana, <laughs> I hope I said that correctly, um, who is a lecturer of English and computer assisted language learning at Silpakorn University in Thailand. He's currently studying for a Master of Studies focusing on machine learning and automated language assessment at uh, Homerton College at the University of Cambridge and he's joining us from Cambridge uh, today. He's recently finished his PhD in Applied Linguistics and he's previously studied an MSc in Teaching English Language in University Settings at Oxford University and he's done an MA in Digital Language and Literacies at Lancaster University. He's also an Associate Editor of Reflections Journal and an Associate Editor of the International Journal of Southeast Asian Media Studies. So a wide range of experience and interests there for NAPAP. And finally, last but definitely not least, Professor Marina Orsini-Jones, who is Professor of Global Higher Education Practice, Applied Linguistics, and Associate Head of School for Global Engagement in the School of Humanities at the University of Coventry. She's also an associate in the Research Centre for Global Learning and a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Now, <laughs> who was that? <laughs> that was a the noise there. I think if we can mute our microphones. It sounded um, like Liam to me. <laughs> sounded like Liam, eh? If it is, mute your microphone. So she's been involved in e-learning innovation. <laughs> No one's putting their hand up to that. She's been involved in e-learning innovation in language learning and teaching since the late 80s and presented at over 100 national and international conferences. She's published a lot of work in her areas of expertise that include blended learning, MOOCs, telecollaboration, collaborative online international learning, COIL and virtual exchange. Um, and threshold concepts informed action research in languages and linguistics. In 2013, she was awarded a National Teaching Fellowship from the Higher Education Academy, uh, a prestigious award in recognition of the cross-sector impact of her work on the development of innovative practice in language learning and teaching. She is the lead for multiple international projects in relation to technology enhanced learning, and she believes in the positive transformational impact of pedagogically sound technology enhanced learning and teaching. And so on that fabulous inspirational note, I'm going to hand over to our speakers who will present their ideas. And after that, we'll have time for questions and for discussion. And I believe, Barbara, you're up first, aren't you? So perhaps you could share your slides and kick us off. Thank you. I am. Okay, uh, before we get uh, started with Barbara, uh, I've received a few messages of people that want to get in that, that must be waiting for you to let them. Uh, yeah, we've done that. Yeah. All right. OK. Cool. Right, so um, I'm going to go and proceed and share my screen now. So hopefully it's going to be okay in the display mode. Yes, does it work? Yeah, we can see that. Okay, and hear me okay. Right, so I'm aware I only have 10 minutes, so I'm just going to be precise and I'm going to actually focus on one of my research questions of my PhD. Uh, as um, Katie already mentioned, uh, I look at the goal setting behavior of adult language learners in MOOCs, this unit have moved, and uh, what I'm looking at specifically is the support that these MOOC um, authors and MOOC providers offered to online learners, online language learners, to support this self-regulatory process. So uh, I'm just going to start briefly by looking at short definition of MOOCs and how it relates to self-regulated learning. And then I'm going to proceed to um, sort of unpack what it's going done, what has been done in the field of MOOCs regarding the goal setting and its uh, corresponding support. And I'm going to briefly uh, mention some of my research findings related to, as I said, uh, my last research question in my PhD. And I'm just going to open the floor to discussion. So. Um, 
basically what we know for MOOCs is that they are obviously um, providing education for thousands of thousands of people around the world. But what sometimes we have hidden message or there's an implicit message is that in order for you to be successful in a MOOC, you need to be able to assume responsibility for your learning. In words of Jimeno science, um, you need to um, self-regulate your learning. That is that you need to adopt a sort of a skills cognitive and resource management strategies for you to manage your learning more successfully. But what is exactly self-regulated learning? Well, one of the first theories in this um, concept was Zimmerman, who later uh, proposed a model um, that you're going to see next. And the thing is that for self-regulated learning, participants are actually metacognitive, motivationally, and behaviorally active participants of their own learning. So as uh, mentioned, here is the uh, model that Zimmerman and Moylan proposed in 2009. They consist of three phases, forethought, performance, and self-reflection phase. And I wanted to notice how the goal setting is the key that unlocks the whole cycle for you to start um, taking responsibility for your learning and concentrating all your efforts to learn successfully. So um, we move on to what exactly is goal setting. So goal setting here refers to identifying the outcome that one expects to attain at a particular point in time. So for example, if I am preparing to go for um, a nice meal in a French restaurant and I'm not a speaker of French, I should be prepared in advance at least a couple of sentences that will help me to just have a proper conversation with the waitress and order the right meal. Uh, that will be a goal on itself and I wanted to make sure that I will review a set of expressions for this context that is um, order something successfully in a restaurant within an hour of study. So that for it, that for it will be the example of a goal. But what we uh, sometimes assume is that self-regulated learning as it's something autonomous is that well learners can do it on its own and that's not necessarily the case. Self-regulatory process like goals and setting goals can be supported by the help of others. In MOOCs this can be actually uh, scaffolded by adding prompts, feedback, sometimes the combination of both and integrated support systems um, like intelligent tutors. Um, this was done by the work there was a systematic literature review conducted by Wong and her colleagues that actually review all the sort of um, support systems available, not only in MOOCs, but also in online courses. There is an issue now, and this is our famous gap in knowledge, and is that little is known about the existence of similar features that support the goal setting um, self-regulatory process in uh, MOOCs. Here I, I mentioned language MOOCs, but it's also the case of the content-based MOOCs as we know it. So uh, what I wanted to know during my uh, research um, question number three was to identify and go deeper, deeper into the universe of MOOCs and identify what elements related to those courses actually support learners' goal-setting behavior. Now, um, let me just refer back to what I uh, did. So I conducted a multiple case study and in which it consisted of the participation of 19 students. Uh, this was uh, divided into two groups. So one group was studying um, Spanish, Italian and French courses in the UK. And the other case study was um, studying English for a specific purposes in Italy. So basically, the way I generated all the data that you're going to see uh, summarized in the findings is that I conducted an interview at the beginning, semi-structured interview at the beginning. Then I led the learners to choose their own MOOCs and they work on their book for four weeks. This was constantly monitored with weekly online surveys where participants were asked to reflect upon their learning. And one of the questions were asking them about their personal learning goals and to also mention what they like about their course um, and what kind of barriers or obstacles they they sort of deal with. Um, I also asked them to capture in this form of a screenshot the activity or a tool that facilitated their 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 goal setting behavior. Uh, Obviously, my idea was to look at the goal setting behavior, but for them, I just framed the, the task in just take a picture of the, take a screenshot of the MOOC, a section or an activity that 
facilitate your learning or that you actually enjoy and explain why in the form of a caption. By the end of their course uh, of the third and fourth week, I send them an open-ended questionnaire with some follow-up questions, which were sort of built up during the semi-structured interview that, at, that happened at the end of the whole um, uh, study. So what we got, the findings. Um, First of all, I need to talk about the personal lear learning goals because I needed to also understand how the MOOC elements were going to support uh, a specific uh, different uh, learning goals identified in the data. So usually there is this tendency in research and MOOCs that we send questionnaires to participants and we just ask them to choose their goal. In my case, uh, in, in my research was completely the opposite. I asked them for their goals and during my data analysis, I identify and classify. And what you see here is a taxonomy of goals that adult language learners um, reported within the context of my study. So first you see the mastery or learning goals that they focus on understanding the subject of the MOOC that was covered and also developing their language skills or any linguistic knowledge as you see um, in the examples given by Eric and Estella. Then we also have ability goals, and it refers to actually demonstrating, sorry, they actually, um, they refer to demonstrating their linguistic competences, but also to challenge their own competences. Because um, usually what we see is that we expect learners to perform better and focus on getting a good grade or getting a certificate. That was not the case of my participants. So what I spot here was that they wanted to actually prove themselves that they could, for example, um, listening better or um, getting the right uh, answer within a specific amount of attempts in a grammar exercise. Uh, then we have the reinforcement goal, that it was a goal that has not previously been described in the literature. This was mainly related to participants in case study one. They were looking only at uh, language MOOCs. So as you can see, an example of this goal is that they were focused on revising a specific grammar topic that they have already um, previously covered in their face-to-face -face lessons or in previous learning experiences. So it was more about consolidating their linguistic knowledge. And finally, we have process goals. These ones are very interesting because um, they are going to support the achievements of the previous three goals I mentioned. So it consists of the practice and the rehearsal of a specific techniques that are generated by the um, the students or sometimes are held by the teachers. As you can see here, uh, the teachers have ad advised the, the student to summarize in writing what I read and uh, they usually follow a sequence that is going to help them to work towards either their mastery goals, ability goals or reinforcement goals. So now we need to find this relation of how the elements of the MOOC, if there were any, help to support and work towards the personal learning goals I just mentioned, I, I just described. So during the whole data analysis, I identified three main elements in common uh, that occurred in participants in case study one that were looking at language MOOCs and participants in case study two that were looking at content-based MOOCs. So, uh, first element that we found in common was multimedia resources. So as Elena mentioned at the beginning, MOOCs are very well known for having quality resources and actually this influence the um, work toward mastery, reinforcement and ability goals. Participants actually sort of um, praise and they acknowledge they were very pleased to have audiovisual resources, also specialized articles to work with, the forums, and also something that uh, hasn't come up much in the literature when we talk about, you know, the benefits of uh, the multimedia resources are transcripts that participants, especially uh, learning a second language, use um, a lot, not only for learning new vocabulary, but also to look at the structures or in this case, syntactic structures or even deeper aspects of the language, such as the register, an academic register. Then we have the flexibility offered by a MOOC. This is not a very inherent quality. This is something that mm, the MOOCs allow to have when MOOC authors are designing the courses. They are the ones who decide to let the, the participants go back and forth to the courses to repeat uh, audiovisual material as much as they want. And this actually facilitated the pursuit of mastery performance and ability goals. 
uh, since not only it kind of gives them an active role in their online learning, but um, especially this distinctive feature help participants to practice and rehearse those techniques known as process goals um, to work towards the main three goals I mentioned. So I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the process goals participants would set to improve pronunciation would be to listen into the video material uh, stop it and try to imitate the intonation of the authors. This is something that could be done thanks to the flexibility, the flexible nature of the MOOCs. And last but not least, it has to do with the uh, structured learning material. Uh, this sometimes can be seen as something negative when we look at this, the, the MOOCs are very fixed and rigid, but actually it turns out something positive for participants, especially for those who were doing the MOOC for the first time, for those who consider online learning as something scary and daunting and overwhelming. Well, the structured learning design, it actually provides a path to organize their flexible learning and at the same time to engage with the all these sort of um, multimedia resources and be able to engage with the material in a flexible way. So at the end, it helped them to facilitate their learning, uh, reinforce that information they wanted to cover and uh, develop their language skills, as I see there. The last question, I'm not sure uh, how much I'm in time. This is a question for the audience and it's because during the data analysis, I also did a sort of um, more personal investigation of the prompts that are supposed to be offered in MOOCs regarding to goal setting. You know, as mentioned in the, the literature, it says that this self-regulatory process can be scaffolded and supported with different prompts or feedback or anything. That was very limited. Those were the only three elements I discovered during the during the uh, during my study. However, my question for you is if we we agree that learners should rely on MOOCs, in this particular case, MOOC authors, MOOC designers, MOOC mentors, MOOC facilitators, and also MOOC providers to set their personal learning goals. And if not, who then should be looking after that self-regulatory process? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Barbara. Um, really thought provoking. I really like the, that you finished with a question. Um, right. Um, we have Napat next. Right. Thank you. Uh, who's going to talk to us about defining success in language MOOCs? Whose voices should we listen to? Napat, the floor is yours. Thank you. Right. Okay. Let me uh, try and share my screen. Right, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk and I'm very happy to be uh, speaking to you today. And yeah, I'm glad that I came after Barbara because I mean, some of the results from my study can be related to, to what she has just talked about as well. Uh, so I guess one of the topic that uh, has been under research in MOOC literature is how we define success in language MOOC. I mean, given the open nature of the MOOC, you know, it can be difficult to, to say, well, this is the, this, well, you are successful in participating in the MOOCs, right? Because, I mean, people would, would come from different backgrounds, they would have different goals. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about how we can perhaps, you know, like, uh, look for the ways that we can not really find a single uh, definition, but I mean, just to, to see, you know, how they, those definitions are being described by the learners right now. So the, the outline of my talk today, uh, first I talk about some success measures in language MOOC context, right? Uh, the measures that have been used, or at least uh, the measure that, uh, you know, sort of a lot of the teachers are using as the lens to actually, uh, evaluate their learners in the MOOCs. Then I will talk about the study that I did, and I did it as a part of my PhD, which I was, which I just finished last year. Then I talk about the findings of the of the uh, research, and then I will talk about you know what we can do in the future with with the the result of the study. 
So uh, success in MOOCs, really. I mean, it it's not only in language MOOC. I think success, uh, that, I mean, how people define success has been under research, not just in language MOOC, but also in MOOCs uh, research in general as well. Uh, one definition that uh, a lot of researchers have uh, agree, it's, well, it's one key characteristic of success is maybe the accomplishment of some pre-identified uh, goals that that learners actually have or the teachers actually have. Uh, but that in and of itself actually raises a lot of questions because uh, the objectives would be different from different stakeholders. And I mean, if you look at uh, one MOOC offerings, we would have so many people involved. We have universities, we have instructor, we have designer, and we also have learners as well. And uh, these stakeholders all have different objectives, you know, when, when, they, when they create the MOOC or when they enroll in the MOOC. Uh, so let's start from the university's point of view or MOOCs providers and so on. Uh, perhaps I think one, one thing that uh, I think MOOCs has been seen as a, as a tool to market, you know, like uh, their university, their uh, website and, and, and so on. So I think uh, perhaps uh, one way that a uh, provider will see success in the MOOC is that uh, they have a high number of people who enroll in the course or the course being recognized by a wider group of people. However, uh, when we uh, look at how teachers actually see uh, success in, in language MOOC, and this also related to learners as well, uh, a lot of the teachers uh, may see success in language MOOC as their learners being able to start to uh, to do quizzes uh, in the MOOC uh, to score well on the assignment that they have to do, or you know their learners uh, are active in the forums, and even some of them may see completion of the course really as a measure for for success for for their learners. I mean, these are these two stakeholders are quite straightforward in terms of what they actually see. However, when it comes to learners, it's a different story because I mean, as we all know, MOOCs uh, have a very diverse uh, demography. You know, like we have people who, I mean, in terms of both uh, age, educational background, in terms of professions, in terms of their goals in terms of their learning objectives, in terms of their learning style even. So, I mean, when it comes to what success means to the learner, it's a really uh, difficult uh, question to answer. And I don't think we will ever find one single uh, definition for, for this group of learners. So that leads me to uh, investigate further into, into these issues. And uh, I think there are some uh, success measures that have been used. And I think one of the most uh, common one, and I mean, it's the easiest one to, to look at is whether or not learner actually complete the MOOC. And, but I mean, there, there are a lot of problems associated with that as well. Uh, you know, because just, you know, a lot of the learners, they come into the MOOC, they just want to learn something and just want to, uh, move on with their lives and, and so on. So the, the, the concept of using uh, com, com, completion rate as a, as a success measure in MOOCs is in and of itself uh, contains a lot of problems in that. Uh, there are some researchers who propose that maybe we can use uh, learner intentions okay, as, as a way to, to uh, set the definition of success in language MOOC. Again, uh, because learners are so diverse, they all come to MOOCs with very different reasons. Some uh, take the MOOC because of, uh, you know, just they are interested in, in the topic. Some they do it because of their job. Some do it because it's a part of their studies and so on and so forth. So with, you know, this wide array of reasons, we really, need, we really don't know what success means to, to all the learners. So uh, in the research, in, in my research, uh, this 
this particular research was guided by one research question and it's a really it's a really broad research question and it's really open to to the learners to to share their thoughts so how do language learners define their success in an l mood and in my data collection, I collected uh, my data from Elmuk on presentation offered by KMUTT, which is a uni in Thailand. Uh, I collected the data from 137 learners. And of those, uh, 105 of them were learners who actually completed the course. And 32 of them were students who actually dropped out. So, uh, I mean, I would have liked to have an equal numbers, but I mean, I think this is uh, the, the number that I had. And I collected the data through two main research tools. I had a questionnaire sent out to them and they respond. And in the questionnaire, I, I asked them mainly about their intention to, to study in the course, whether they actually want to finish the whole course or what their reason of, of participating in the MOOCs. And then I interviewed them afterwards. Uh, so the findings, really, I actually categorized the finding into two main groups, right? The first group was those uh, learners who actually completed okay, the MOOCs, and uh, they felt that their learning in the MOOC was a success, okay? Perhaps not surprising. Uh, one interesting thing uh, that came out from the from the questionnaire response was, I mean, these groups of learners, they actually had an initial intention to complete the course before they actually enroll. Okay, so so that's that's one thing to to keep in mind. Uh, we also went further and and asked them about you know how how would they actually define their success in language move, and we get a really wide range of of answers. So the first one was uh, some of them felt that they their participation in the MOOC was successful because they could learn a specific part of the course that they wanted to learn. Okay, and it has nothing to do with completion, has nothing to do with, with uh, studying the whole course at all. Some of them felt that uh, their success in language move is associated with whether or not their language has improved or not, okay? And I mean, the word improvement here means that they felt that their language was better at the end of the course, right? The third, the third one, uh, the third uh, reason that, that they uh, cited was uh, they felt that they, they were successful because they accomplished their learning goals and their learning goals can be varied, right? And this, this is also related to, to the first two as well. The fourth one is they were able to apply what they learned in the course with their work or with their studies. And the last one is completion, okay? So, I mean, there are still uh, quite a high number of learners who still felt that they would only be successful in the AMU if they actually complete the course. Uh, the, the other category, the other group that I had was those uh, learners who dropped out. Uh, these learners also felt that their learning in the AMU was, was a success. Uh, however, they specifically and clearly uh, stated in their responses that when they first enrolled into the MOOC, they had no intention to finish the course in the first place. Okay, and, and that they, they, they made it quite clear in their responses. Uh, in terms of their reason of feeling the success in the MOOCs, again, it, it was quite similar with the, the group who finished the course that they felt that they could learn a specific part of the course. Okay, they accomplished their learning goals and they could really apply what they, uh, what they learn into their work or studies. And what does the finding mean to us really? Uh, I think uh, one thing that we at least have come to know in 2022 is that, yeah, complete change should not 
be a sole measure of success, not just in language move, but in MOOCs uh, in general as well. I'm not saying we should not use completion at all, because I mean, there are some people who still feel that they would only be uh, successful if they actually complete the course, right? Uh, but I mean, it should not be a sole measure of success. And there are other measures that, that we should allow okay, for learners to, to use in order to measure their success. And the word success perhaps should be determined by participant learning goals and intentions. And it should, of course, really be defined by the participant themselves. And I think uh, the, the findings from, from this study in many ways really just uh, serve as a representation of a stage that you know, was proposed a few years ago that perhaps now learning in, in an online environment, it's, it's now being in a stage that we call atomized core, right? So it's not just people coming to learn things from one to 100, okay? They, they come and learn bits and pieces from different places. And once they are satisfied with what they learn, they just move on to uh, different tools or perhaps a different uh, online spaces. And the last one is, I think I really, I really propose that, I guess, uh, in terms of defining success in language MOOC, we should really uh, be open in terms of how learners can actually define their own success. Uh, so what does this mean to us as LMOOC teachers, LMOOC researchers, and, and LMOOC designers? I think uh, one thing that we can do is I think we perhaps need to be more flexible in terms of creating assign, uh, assessment criteria for, for an LMOOC that we are teaching or we are designing. And also, uh, we perhaps need to be aware that there are several possible learning pathways that learner can take. And those pathway can actually lead them to be successful in learning in language mode. And this is not just us as teachers that we should be aware of that. I think it's perhaps our job as well to, to make sure that learners are also aware that there are many possible pathways that they can take in, in order to be successful in participating in language mode. And because I think learning goals are so important. I mean, at, at least in, in my uh, in the results of my study, we should perhaps uh, find ways to encourage learner to make their learning goals explicit at the time of enrolling. Because I mean, if we feel that one way that they can feel successful is to be able to accomplish their goals, perhaps it is uh it would be wise if we could five you know some sort of activities or some something that they can they can uh do at the beginning of the course to make sure that they really have a clear goals of what they want to do okay when they participate in the MOOC and I mean as a researcher or even teacher really I think once we have the learning goals in mind once we know what the student actually want in a particular course what we can do is we can use all the learning data that that we have you know to sort of keep track of how uh, learners are uh, learning towards their goal or if there are learners who are struggling we might you know offer some uh, additional help in in order to help them really uh, achieve their goals. And uh, I think there is a lot of research potential okay, in this area. Uh, I think uh, this, my research was, was a really small uh, scale one. Okay, we, we only did it with 137 students. I think uh, you know, there is a lot of potential that we can expand research on success in language move you know, to you know, different countries and in different regions as well. Uh, right, so yeah, that's the end of my presentation. And I mean, the, the findings from this study was actually published uh, last January. So if you are interested, you can, you can read uh, more about this in, in the reference here as well. So I'm open uh, the floor to, to questions, please.
Thank you. Thank, thank you, Napad. Um, I think we to, 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 to give it agility, we are going to leave the questions till right. the end, and that way we'll all open uh, the discussion to everyone. Um, really interesting right. talk. Uh, you say that your your research was small scale, but actually you've touched upon uh, several really important issues in, in mm. ELMOC research, such as what's success or right. the li different learning pathways that mm. uh, you know, a, a, a learner can take. So uh, there's a lot of food for thought in your presentation. Mm -hmm. And I encourage all the um, participants to read your papers, you know, Barbara's, Marina's and, and yours, because you all, the three of you have published extensively over, over um, language MOOCs. Mm -hmm. So Marina, um, where are you? I cannot see you now. <laughs> um, it's your turn. You can um, see me. I ah, am, yeah, I am and, here. Like, I can. Marina is going, uh, going to talk about a language teacher education MOOCs as a powerful global third space for language learning and teaching. She's been uh, combining, um, you know, making all sorts of combinations with face-to-face uh, -face, uh, teaching and learning with MOOCs and her master's programs and, and I just find it fascinating. So over to you Marina. Uh, hi, I always suffer from imposter syndrome when I come to these events because I don't use language MOOCs, strictly speaking. I do teach uh, students on masters how to become teachers of English and I ask them to use MOOCs to learn how to become global citizens as well. But So what I like to, to do is a bit of session plan, so communicative competence, intercultural competence, global competence, a strong case for blends, and I know Josef Kolperhert doesn't like me using the word blends and blended, but I, I embrace the blends. And um, be melted case study, some of you have heard it before, but to reassure Liam and others who heard it before, this is the more recent outcomes. Um, and so how you mix MOOCs with telecollaboration and conclusion. And I'm, I was really glad to hear what Barbara had to say about lowering anxiety, because that is coming out of what I found as well. And um, the other thing is we have to rethink communicative competence, intercultural communicative competence. It looks like, um, uh, well, Crunch reports that uh, we're talking about global competence in the States. So, you know, the American Council for the Teaching of Foreign Languages is not even mentioning intercultural or communicative. It's just going for global competences, which is where my talk fits in a way. So the idea that we really have to operate globally, even if in the Times Higher Education magazine yesterday, there was a, an article, is it the end of globalization because of what's happening in the Ukraine? Well, food for thought, I hope it isn't. But the thing is, uh, there was something else which fa I found in a report, in a kind of post and lessons learned from the pandemic report, which really ties with what I do as well. And this was published by the higher education sector, a lot of experts. And in this report, they, they summarized the findings from a post-pandemic scenario and pandemic. So the future of higher education is blended. And there is these technology enabled opportunities, which I think both uh, um, Napat and, and Barbara have mentioned in the context of MOOCs. I think definitely MOOCs are a, an opportunity for a lot of us. There is a personalization of the learning journey, which again, Barbara mentioned, it can be very structured, but it can be very helpful. So you personalize your structure within the structure. Uh, and so it, it is useful to personalize within a MOOC. And the idea of widening participation, and there's no doubt that technology, yes, there is digital poverty. However, there is also a lot of us being here, 80 or 30 of us, uh, without being in a place together, but we can be here without traveling. And of course, inclusivity, um, I think diversity inclusion comes into what we do with MOOCs and also with virtual exchange. And this idea of getting people who don't know each other from different contexts meeting in this third space, which is decolonized because most users of this second language education MOOCs, in, the, in my experience, my students and the people we work with in China, in Spain, in, um, in the Netherlands, or in Brazil or in Sri Lanka, they're all L2 speakers. This is quite important because if we want to decolonize the, the curriculum in English language teaching and stop talking about mother tongue, we, can, we have to open up to L2 spaces to people who are not that confident. Those, so that confident in those spaces. And so this creation of blends really in an idea to decolonize and help with third space. So hybrid spaces enabling epistemological 
sorry, my bell ringing, I'm at home. Uh, epistemological, ontological growth in social collaborative, multilingual, multimodal, and multiliteracy multi settings, which I think both MOOCs and virtual exchanges are, which is why I mix them together. And this idea of the decolonized turn uh, and the also intercultural turn, as Thorne calls it, can really be facilitated in these environments. And we want to, to develop this idea of global context impacting on your, our teaching and learning. And I think, in a way, the pandemic uh, has really helped with this. Of course, uh, language, second language learning research also shows that language learning must be contextual, dynamic and personal. And having just worked with a country I will not mention and seen the textbooks, it breaks my heart that we're still using those textbooks and instead of live things we can do together online. So um, I think it's quite important that we bear in mind contextual, dynamic, personal. And again, MOOCs can be personalized in their journey. So I think uh, I'm after a bit of Helmut Gass in the telecollaboration too, back in 2010, but still valid. I, I think that this liminal third space where there could be transformational for teachers involved in language teaching. So teachers involved in teacher education, but uh, also their future as language teachers can be transformational, can be agentifying, can create the Kumaravadivelo kind of complex approach to you as a teacher taking control of your own teaching, as opposed to learning from Ellis, Noonan, and all the others telling you from what countries what to do. And of course, Penny Cook and Prabhu have said this as well. But I think working in these environments really opens up a lot of new opportunities, new competencies, new ways of doing things and exploring ways of doing languages things. So what do I do? Um, I piggyback on MOOCs created by Kate mainly and others. So my students who are studying on a master's in language, in, you know, teaching languages and teaching English, they join a MOOC, but we also join the MOOC with people from Brazil, people from China, people from Spain, people from Sri Lanka, and we all meet in Zoom to discuss what we've learned from the MOOC. And the MOOC in, in question uh, on this occasion was uh, the, oh, I'm going to mention it in a second, the one from Future Learn, which um, Kate designed. But this idea of Bimelty, which is blending MOOCs in English language teaching with telecollaboration for English language teachers, is quite, quite a long mouthful. It used to be shorter before. But this idea of getting teachers in English teacher education of novice teachers or future teachers to embrace their holistic approach to communicative competence, intercultural competence, becoming global and global um, skills in action while engaging in the MOOC and in the virtual exchange, on action after having engaged and for action for their future practice. So um, this idea is also a virtual exchange. I know that uh, all of you probably know already the definition from Evolve, but this idea that it is a practice supported by research where you use technology with constructive communication and these you know, individual in groups who are geographically separated is really kind of expanded and amplified by the MOOC. So when you attach a MOOC to a virtual exchange, you really gain a lot in terms of global impact. And um, so the idea of this mix of virtual exchange and MOOCs is to repurpose and incorporate the MOOCs, debunk the myths of the native speaker. And I'm becoming quite allergic to, to this expression, but you should see how many adverts still want native speakers, which is quite scandalous in my opinion, uh, in my humble opinion of being still Italian and teaching how to teach English, but anyway. And the idea to decolonize ELT, encourage meta-reflection and support these skills and competencies I showed you earlier. So, the MOOC was uh, Kate's, in my case. I'll try and speed up a bit. I can see Ellen looks very, very worried. I'll speed up a bit, Ellen, now, because we need some time for questions. But this MOOC was ideal for us because it contained exactly my syllabus. So it had what is language learning and teaching? What is task-based language learning and teaching? What is continent language integrated learning? What is online language learning and teaching? What are global Englishes? These are the things we cover on the masters on my module. And so we could do it within the virtual exchange with our partners on Zoom synchronous. And then, but, but then the MOOC was our kind of flipped 
classroom because the students have to study the MOOC, come in, tell us what they discussed on the MOOC with the people in the MOOC, and then bring in the knowledge and bring the, what they found in the MOOC, which they were learning, join with our syllabus and with the syllabus in Brazil, in Sri Lanka and Spain and China. So, of course, there have been various iterations of this and latest was Brazil, Spain and Sri Lanka. And so the students then go on Padlet, on Zoom, and they reflect on what they learned on the MOOC and what they learned in class in their respective countries and what they're learning through in action on the synchronous virtual exchange telecollaboration. So this is just an example of in action tab Padlet. This is content and language integration in action again. Um, and uh, so when we then do the reflections on action and we ask the students in focus groups, this is incidentally qualitative, not quantitative. So the idea is that they do seem to gain this global citizenship skills they need to have, but also it seems to generate, and I'll, I'll show you the second quote, which is more important. Um, of course, these are verbatim. Most of these are L2 speakers, so there are some not perfect English quotes, but before MOOC, I thought that face-to-face -face classes are more effective and engaging before there is face-to-face -face interaction. However, after MOOC, I realized that interaction can be provided from the online platform as well. Also, I realized that online learning is more suitable for me. Uh, this is quite powerful. This is quite transformational. So a teacher completely changing the mind after the experience. I feel face-to-face -face learning has some advantages that you don't depend on devices, technical issues. Nevertheless, online learning and teaching have advantages as well. I found some students seem to focus more online since they don't get distracted by other students. That's an interesting one. Additionally, as a student, I enjoyed learning through some online games. Of course, we did a bit of online games attached to the MOOCs. And then, of course, this idea of transformation, my beliefs have changed. Um, I'll let you leave it and now we're able to create and develop online class and we have more tools than before. So the idea that the virtual exchange and the MOOC are also tools for them they can use in the future. And interesting as well, uh, the, as a teacher I realized it was very effective and left room for creativity. So again, this idea that you can be in a structured environment, but it can give you ideas for creativity. So quite powerful quotes here, and I have many more, but I haven't got time to show you many more. But in terms of research questions, can we then promote an idea that you can't just stick to those four 20th century skills, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, which are still what textbooks are based on, really. Can we debunk the textbooks as well with this? Yes. But interestingly enough, despite or because of the pandemic, there still are there still is some resistance to technology. So I'm still encountering a bit of that, but much less than before. And of course, students are now embracing more, students in teacher education, embracing more everything technical. And can it promote intercultural awareness and also build confidence as L2 teachers of English? Yes, definitely so. And that was a reverberating what Barbara was saying as well, lowering a bit of anxiety, making them feel more confident. And can we support the identification of troubles of knowledge in English, which can be uh, generated by engaging with MOOCs and virtual exchange? Yes. And also transformational beliefs and practice. And reflection is still a bit problematic, whether you do it online or face to face. I feel, however, that reflection online using Padlet on things you've done together can help. So conclusion, and I've sped it up a bit. Um, I'm going to put uh, a little, oops, sorry. I'm going to put this uh, link in the chat and I'm sorry it was really fast, even faster than usual for me, I gather. Uh, but I think I managed to stay to time, possibly even shorter than I should have. So if I put this link in the chat, I just like everybody, um, whether you have done combinations like I've done or similar, how do you feel about MOOCs and VEs for teacher education? Would you consider to use something like this? Have you used it? Um, and can you just insert some keywords? Answer Garden doesn't allow big sentences. One or two words which come to mind. And while you do that, I'll pass the, uh, everything back to Elena and Kate, and perhaps I'll share the screen on Answer Garden later well, after people have posted whatever they want to post. So thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you, and th thank you for bringing some interactivity into the talk. I love Answer Garden, so I, I hope our participants online are entering those keywords and, and uh, 
and yeah, and broadening that insight into uh, into LMOOCs. Uh, and don't feel as an imposter, Marina, uh, because I always uh, love what you have to say. I love blends and I love how you remix, repurpose, uh, you know, all what you have in your mind uh, for the benefit of your students. And I thank you for bringing teachers and student teachers into the conversation um, because they, they are important um, for language mock practice and, and research. So, um, yeah, I'm, never, I'm not a fan of reinventing wheels either. I absolutely, I mean, we have to move on together. So I, I've been taking lots of notes. Thank you, uh, the three of you. Uh, it, it, it's been um, really enriching uh, for me personally. So I want to open the floor to everyone. Uh, if you have a question, you can um, enter it in the chat box or you can open your microphone and raise your hand and, and participate. Um, do we have any question yet or is everyone entering the keywords in the answer garden? Nobody what? is. Oh, really? I'll... Well, I have. <laughs> Refresh the screen. Well, while, while we give them a bit of time um, to think, I want to go back to the initial question. What did LMOX do for us? And if I had to, uh, after listening to the three of you, if I had to give a single answer, uh, I would say they put the spotlight on the learner. You know, uh, it's um, they, they, they have given us uh, a deeper insight into autonomous self-regulated learning as Barbara has explained. And of course we knew that they have given us lots, lots of multimedia resources like the ones that Marina is using in her master's programs or in her projects in, in telecollaboration, they have given us flexibility, but at the same time, uh, structured learning design. And, and that leads me to a question that if no one asks a question, I will ask you uh, at the end. Um, they've led us to redefine success in language learning. Uh, as Napat rightly said, completion is not the only measure. Uh, of success. Thank you, Napat, for uh, putting in the voice of the dropouts, because for me that's vital. Uh, we very rarely hear from them, mm. uh, and, and dropouts are just not uh, outcasts. You know, right. uh, uh, learners that have been chucked out of the course or couldn't cope with the course. No, uh, in in MOOCs there are many of them, and I include myself in those uh, that register in MOOCs and get what we are interested in and leave and go on, yeah. on to do something else. Yeah. And I don't consider that as a failure. I consider that as a personal success. You know, I've grown uh, as a learner. And also I find uh, really interesting that concept of the third space. They've opened up third spaces in which um, reinterpreting what Marina has said, I've written non-native speakers are empowered. And I completely agree with you, uh, Marina, um, because uh, non-native speakers are the majority, uh, non-native teachers as well. Uh, so why should we feel uh, that we are less than a native speaker or a native teacher? And I want, I want to, to finish also with uh, another of Marina's quotes. The, uh, taken from the report, the future of higher edu education is blended and MOOCs and language MOOCs are part of that future. Um, so thank you, uh, Napad, Barbara and Marina for, for your contributions. And um, I'm looking forward to, to hearing the voices of the other participants. I mean, you can give us, share your experiences mm -hmm. with uh, MOOCs. What have you gained uh, participating in MOOCs as a learner or creating your own MOOC, um, whatever. Kate. Ah, Lim, Lim, we have, a, uh, yeah, you can open your microphone. Over to you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Jesus, if you've done that before, unmuting. Um, thanks for those three wonderful presentations. Hi, Marina. How are you keeping? Alive, I see. Still. Oh, I should show my video. Um, I'm just about to go online here with about 500 undergraduate students. Um, because of COVID, et cetera, et cetera, um, we can't have face-to-face -face if there's more than 300 students. 
it's a it's a, it's a feedback session which is a, bit, a little bit premature because I'm getting a lot of anecdotal evidence from from colleagues that are saying that our students are fed up with screen time teaching. I can appreciate the heterogy and the heterogeneous effects that you're attempting to promote here. My question is 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 are you experiencing the same any sort of backlash or, or pushback here? Um, from students against online teaching here or does is this going to be a temporary thing because of uh, as we emerge from from the pandemic um but as i say i'm going to get feedback from about 500 students at two o'clock today um <laughs> i have two questionnaires for them but what i'm hearing from from my final year students and also from my colleagues is there's a certain backlash against um online screen learning and the whole experience they want face to face they are social animals and i just love to hear your your experiences if you're experiencing the same um or or, or different i'll stop speaking now hi tiziana by the way elena what do you think um you all have, uh, marina and pat and, and barbara if you if you want uh to answer to liam Otherwise, my, answer is, <laughs> my answer is in the chat, so he can read it. All right. Ah, your job. <laughs> Proselytizing. <laughs> <laughs> Students still prefer face to face. With uh, my, I mean, job uh, my experience is a bit different to yours because my university is a distance learning university. Uh, yeah. So obviously, yeah. those that register, they yeah. know what they are in for. Mm -hmm. uh, but also with with MOOCs, what I find is that uh, we open up the, 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 the options. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I th and, and I want to differentiate uh, re emergency remote teaching, which is what you've been forced to do, mm -hmm. and quality online teaching. Uh, so we shouldn't put them both in the same bag because they are not the same. Uh, when when <laughs> we, you know, we had uh, to stay at home back in 2020, um, I got lots of emails from colleagues all over Spain asking us, you know, how do you do it at UNED, at, at your university? Because now we have to teach online. And uh, of course, they didn't know where to start. But that was an emergency situation and they didn't have time to adapt their curriculum to an online curriculum because it is not the same uh, and what marina is saying many of them work with textbooks and and we tend to use digital resources i mean it's a completely different thing um, so i think that's where the disappointment comes from also from students and from teachers alike uh, so uh what we need to understand, I mean, you were you were telling us that you, you are forced now to, to go online with, you know, hundreds of students because of the restrictions. That's not the ideal scenario, you know. Um, so, so your starting point is completely different uh, to ours. Um, it's like, you know, you, you, you need to set the rules for a game and, and you feel cheated if the rules change halfway through and that's what you're feeling, I think. So um, that, that my, my answer, my short answer would be uh, really you need to know what you, what you want or what you are being forced to do. If you haven't chosen to learn online, of course, you'll be unhappy. If you've chosen to, to learn online, it's because of some other circumstances. And then, you know, there's an easier road to success in that sense. And Barbara, okay. I wanted to say, Barbara, what, what's your, your opinion at the Open University? Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit more. And there is this sort of stigma associated with online learning and how online learning is not going to be as effective as face-to-face, -face, at least to, you know, engage in social interaction. Uh, just taking, obviously, speaking from my experience of, as a student at the Open University, but also as a researcher who also observed the personal learning goals of participants who use forums in the MOOCs because they were actually aiming to improve their communicative um, skills. And I think there's also uh, an influence on the teacher, and I think that's the role for you, Liam, in, you know, take advantage of the feedback you're going to receive and see how, you know, it's going to be improve but also within conversation with the with the with your students because as elena said there's there's a big difference between being forced to do something and also because of mm -hmm. the circumstances but i guess in future it will be it will be very regrettable 
to go just go back to fully face to face and do not give the second opportunity to um, online learning and obviously an ideal scenario to blended learning as Marina has inspired me. Uh, so I guess it also depends on how we portray the possibilities and opportunities for our students, especially in those sort of like daunting scenarios that it's been the first time that some learners might even just join online to study there. So there's so many thing, work to do still. Marina, you wanted to add something? Well, it's just, I also want like to add something because I've been teaching hybrid and online and face-to-face -face recently, I had three of them. And uh, I felt really impaired when I was face to face because I couldn't do all the things I can do online and I felt I felt really constrained you know I didn't have the padlet I didn't have I couldn't put them in a breakout room so they couldn't mm. talk to each other and I told them and I said why do you still mark us down in your evaluations if we're not face to face when it's so much better online and they but you know they still have this particularly I mean there is a, an intercultural dimension here students from some parts of the world where the internet is not very strong they don't like online. They already got prejudices against it. And no matter what you do, they will mark you down if you do things online. And so there is a big, strong um, intercultural dimension here. I won't name the part of the world I'm referring to, but we have a lot of students from that part of the world, and it really affects our evaluation questionnaires. Because no matter how brilliant we are, and how brilliant they say the lesson is, they still want to see us face to face. So yes, Liam, definitely we are affected. Uh, but we have to debunk that myth as well, and I'm working on it. <laughs> I also liked uh, in, in Barbara's presentation, with, um, she was talking about giving feedback online and, and that reflexive photography that she mentioned. And I want to, uh, to, to highlight the potential of multimodal feedback, which is not possible in face-to-face, -face, which links with what Marina was just saying. And um, that multimodality, um, that you know we, we are so used to with the, if we WhatsApp uh, our friends, that should be brought into education and should be normalized as well. And I, I find that very powerful. Um, also, uh, I wanted to ask the three of you because you uh, all mentioned as one of the strengths of the of MOOCs, um, the design, the structured learning, you know, the different pathways. But um, um, do you think it, it is possible to create a successful connectivist um, language MOOC? Because they are all pretty much ex MOOCs, really structured, following the, the you know the design of, of regular online courses at the university, a Moodle course, for instance. Do you think it would work having them spread out in different networks and and creating all those links and being really autonomous in generating their learning. What's your opinion? I think um, Kate should answer that question. <laughs> I was going to say, I'd like to hear from NAPAT, actually. <laughs> because I, I'm sure a lot of the things we were talking about um, earlier and answered those questions, but also, uh, you know, about learning goals and the things you have to say but i think you can also come in on connectivism as well mm. so I'm, I'm 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 passing the ball over to napat saying on to you yeah i think uh from my own experience it depends so much on the learning culture so the context right i mean especially in 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 the thai context that i'm working in we learners need some structure really i mean so i think it, it would be perhaps uh not really feasible to have a, a complete c move offered to them uh i think what what would work in thai context would would be the mix of the two really we perhaps need to have some structure at the beginning until they really get the grasp of what they can learn in the MOOCs and then we, we can make it more uh, open and more flexible towards the end of, of the course. I think that's, that's, that's my take on this, yeah. Barbara, would you like to add something? Okay, so I think, um, well, in discussion with my supervisors, we also thought about this duality between C MOOCs and X MOOCs and then we thought, well, you know, that has been so much uh, growth in this field of online courses that you know this duality starts to vanish. So who says 
that maybe we can include some principles of connectivist within instructivist MOOCs. However, I think that I want to add another layer and it has to do with uh, an element that I'm glad to see uh, Thomas Pujola and Christina Apple who has worked on the tandem MOOC and it has to do with the technological infrastructure of the platforms because yes we are talking about you know these theoretic re theoretical approaches that are pedagogies but if the platforms are not provided what we wish for example um, it, the ultimate goal of learners uh, learning a language is to be able to communicate and express their feelings or their opinions in a target language obviously the ideal word in a MOOC is that they could just go into small breakout rooms and start having this in tandem in synchronous conversations but if they Coursera, edX, Fun, Une Abierta, and so many platforms do not have this technological infrastructure, then that can become just a sort of utopia of a digital era. Yeah. Um, can I just, sorry, yeah. can I just come back and answer that? And, and also add support in the, of what, for what Napa and Barbara were saying. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, I think um, what you see now is this kind of mix of whatever's out there and learners uh, taking in the tools that they need to learn and exercising their learner autonomy in that kind of way. I mean, one of the early criticisms about open educational resources was actually the lack of kind of a principled structure there. I think in the notion of there being a kind of free for all, um, and that might work for some people, but how does that really work in helping people to learn? Um, and I've come round to the idea that an element of structure is important and MOOCs have given us that in that open space, but they haven't chained us to it, which I think is linking to Barbara's comment that we can have all of these open tools and ways of working the learner can benefit from the structure but also benefit from the freedom that a MOOC offers and what else is out there so you can kind of get the best of both worlds I think to make the best experience and that's certainly what Juan Thomas and Christina Pell do in their eTandem MOOCs as well so I just wanted to sort of add that coda Marina you had your hand up though to come in <laughs> I was asking for permission to share the the little yeah. you know, so I can just show what, what people have said, collaboration and what, I mean, a solution. I found, I made my own solution by attaching the virtual exchange. And so we do the MOOC, which doesn't have that kind of breakout room opportunity. And we mix it with the virtual exchange. So it's different communities mixing, but it's still a mix. And then of course, things can move from the, the virtual exchange into the chat of the MOOC and there could be cross-fertilization, but at the moment, the structures are not so, you know, they're a bit uh, impermeable in, in the MOOC. So the MOOC is in a way, uh, I find, still very structured in comparison to other solutions, but still can be used to, you know, you can integrate it and make a good use of it. But anyway, uh, thank you for your contribution. So thank you very much for, for what you've written so you can see what you've done and I'll stop sharing and behave. Well, Kate, I think we should, um, if there are not, no more questions, we should probably wrap it up. What do you reckon? Yes, I think yeah, so. I think so. Are there any final questions or comments anyone wants to throw into the mix? I think. Oh, there was uh, a hand up. Yes. Juan Thomas, you had your hand up. Well, yeah, yeah. I wanted to say, you know, something that probably what Maria, Marina is, is doing with the, that blending thing is that because MOOCs are so fixed, sometimes the platforms are so fixed, you need to move and blend it with other to 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 take all the potential because, you know, mostly with, you know, all skills and also with, with that line of flexibility, if, if, you know, choosing your, your goals at the beginning of the MOOC or things like that are very restricted in, in the platforms that we have. So we, uh, I, I think we, 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 start, we have to start moving from, you know, this fixed platform to our own platforms and, and do their, their, their own uh, MOOCs because that would uh, allow us to uh, do more uh, connectivism approaches and and uh, you know emphasize the oral uh, and the speaking uh, skills that they are more restricted in the MOOCs that we have at the moment. I actually agree and also that should be true in the classroom as well. I was just thinking when Marina was talking about what it's like in class for her. Um, for me I'm thinking a lot at the moment about learning spaces 
and and I try and pull in all these tools into the classroom, like Padlet and Answer Garden, and it helps because of the devices that the learners have in the classroom, but also the kind of space you have as well. You know, if you have kind of interactive screens around the classroom, so you can bounce between what students are seeing and they can show what they're seeing, suddenly it brings the technology into the space and you start to have that interactive experience. Mm -hmm. I enjoy that very much, but there's not many of classrooms at my institution that allow me to do that, unfortunately. Um, anyway, Dora's got a hand up, so we should go to Dora for a question. <laughs> yes, uh, hello, thank you. Thank you for all the for this session. I would just be a quick, just like a quick comment I would like to, uh, to do. It's something that you already said before, and especially what Marina said uh, regarding the online or face-to-face or -face courses. And I would like just to add that here in Cyprus, the university where I work, I noticed exactly the same thing. And uh, actually, I was I was wondering why the students don't don't like it, and I'm I'm, I'm wondering if it's, if it's because they are not used to it. Maybe we need some time to to get used to that to that, or even uh, is because they like uh, campus life. Because if they are online, there will be no campus life. There will be uh... so it's just a question. I already have some for some time now, uh, so I just like to share it with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And do any of our speakers want to come back to that and have a response to that? No, it's right. I mean, they want the campus life uh, and they want uh, they want to see people. Uh, they so they're humans. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they, we have to convince them that it could, it could be a blended experience, which is still worth having. Uh, and uh, they need to, and as teachers, they need to learn. I mean, my, my students have to learn to be flexible because the pandemic can happen. And then we, we don't want remote emergency. We want proper training for people who handle hybrid, online, blended. Yeah, absolutely. I agree there. We, we role model when we do these things in our own class and to role model them. If we're teaching teachers, they then go forward and they do the same, don't they? And they can be flexible and they can cope with whatever the world throws at them. So any other questions? I think that's it. I think that's it. I think that's time for us to draw to a close and say a massive thank you to all of our speakers and to all our attendees. How wonderful and um, wonderful, wonderful presentations with so much to think about. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Marina. It's always a pleasure to, to, um, to see you all. Um, and uh, to a successful Eurocall conference this summer too? Yes, um, please join us. Um, we will, um, well, it's hosted by the University of Iceland uh, and uh, we're reviewing a lot of abstracts at the moment uh, and then we'll, you'll hear more about the Eurocall conference and what's going to happen with it uh, in due course. So thank you very much to everyone who's been attending. I'm now going to stop that recording. Okay, thanks. Well, last